Hello and welcome to another video from Whatever Networks. My name is Nicky Cranger and I'm going to be uh, talking to you about installing WebGoat. Uh, WebGoat is a project by the WASP and I will go through some of the top 10 security attacks. We'll also look at the Java prereqs and then we'll go through installing and configuring WebGoat on Windows 10. So what is WebGoat? WebGoat is a it's a software web application that runs on Java and includes lots of insecurities that you can test and protect yourself against. It's, it, it allows you to use something like a Netscaler in my case, where, where then you can put some security above that to protect users from accessing insecure websites. These were for things like SQL injections and cross-site scripting, etc. So there's some good testing that you can do. So let's just go through what these top 10 security attacks are. The first one is injection. Injection flaws such as SQL or LDAP uh, can occur when untrusted data is sent to the interpreter as part of a command or query. The attacker's hostile data can trick the interpreter into executing unintended commands or accessing data without proper authorization. So injecting commands into a URL perhaps or into a form where um, it can get data back uh, that was not intended. Um, so in case you were looking to get hold of John Smith and instead of John Smith you were then returned other people called Smith. So this could be a a form of attack that you'll be able to figure out who else is on that platform rather than the one person that the one piece of data that was allowed to be provided and the next thing we're going to talk about is number two and it's broken authentication um, this is really coming down to uh, where you know sessions are not properly managed are often implemented incorrectly allowing attackers to compromise passwords keys session tokens and exploit other in implementation flaws uh, to assume others' identity um, permanently or, or, or temporary. So, you know, this is really about uh, passwords being compromised, uh, keys being compromised, etc. So, um, things like unsecure or plain text passwords would be something that could be um, could be involved there. The next one is sensitive data exposure. Number three, many web applications and IPAs do not properly protect sensitive data such as financial, healthcare, etc. Attackers may still modify weakly protected data to conduct credit card fraud, identity theft, and other crimes really, really bad. Sensitive data may be compromised without extra protection. And what we would suggest here is where you would like uh, put encryption in variable, use SSL, security trapping, encrypted passwords, etc. So really important about sensitive data. If you were to stick a wire shark or something on a network and did packet sniffing and you were sending text, plain passwords in plain text, they could have easily got picked up between A and B and therefore the attacker could have stole your identity. Uh, not very good. Okay, number four, XML external entities. Many old or poorly configured XML processes evaluate external identity references with HTML documents. External identities can be used to disclose internal files using a URI handler. Internal file shares, internal port scanning, remote code execution, and denial of service attacks. Number five, broken access control. Restricts on what authenticated users are allowed to do and not properly enforce. Attackers can exploit these flaws to gain unauthorized access to data or resources uh, and maybe use another account to view sensitive files or modify other users' data. So, you know, broken access is where you may be able to take your credentials uh, and, and move into an administration role or see other, somebody else's um, user account and take control of that as well. So these are some of the attacks. Let's move on to number six, which is security misconfiguration. Well, this one means that, you know, security misconfiguration is commonly seen issue and, you know, easy to be done. So you're thinking about your passwords uh, that are left at default or you've got a network your management network is on the same network as your internet-facing IP. That could be an issue right there. 
Uh, this is commonly uh, a result of insecure default configurations, incomplete or ad hoc configurations, open cloud storage, misconfigured HTTP headers and uh, verbose error messages containing sensitive information. Not good. Um, so this can affect most like operating systems, frameworks, libraries and applications that can be secured. Uh, they must be patched and upgraded in a timely fashion. So what we're talking about here, security misconfiguration, default settings. Let's move on to number seven, cross-site scripting. So XSS flaw can occur whenever an application includes untrusted data in a web page without proper validation or escaping or updates an existing web page with user-specific data using a browser API that can create a HTML or JavaScript. Cross-site scripting allows the attacker to execute scripts in the victim's browser, which can hijack a user session, deface a website, or redirect to a malicious website. So cross-site scripting could be that if you know that happens to be downloaded or you've, um, you have that in your browser, instead of going to facebook.com, you could be going to facebook.com but actually being redirected to another malicious website. Very, very bad. Insecure deserialization often leads to remote code execution. Even deserialization flaws do not result in remote code execution and can be used to perform attacks, including replay attacks, injection attacks, and privilege escalation attacks. So that's another bad thing if you you can escalate your privileges from a user to an administrator. Using components with known vulnerabilities. Components such as libraries, frameworks, and other software modules run with the same privileges and application. A vulnerable component can be exploited. Such an attack can facilitate a serious data loss or server takeover. Applications and APIs using the components with known vulnerabilities may undermine the application defenses and en enable various attacks or impact. This happened once. Remember that Citrix had an issue with Netscalers and um, a vulnerability was announced and it was quite serious. Um, you know, an attacker could actually put a, a script on, inject a script onto a uh, Citrix Netscaler and then that Netscaler could, um, you know, collect information, etc. Uh, and try to respond back to, to the target. Um, this was quite a serious issue, but, um, you know, it was a vulnerability and it needed urgent patching. You know, that was one of the things, one of the projects I was involved in, it was actually patching, you know, like nearly 30 odd net scalers that had to be done relatively quickly. Uh, in this case, we actually do something called NMAS or Citrix ADM now, as it's called, which can deploy security updates and patches and firmware to Citrix ADCs uh, globally within a very short period of time. Okay, so that's about vulnerabilities. This is about keeping your devices up to date, making sure that you follow the CEV's um, recommendations when they are released and checking with your vendor to ensure that you are um, covered. Let's move into insufficient login and monitoring number 10. Insufficient login and monitoring coupled with the miss missing or inefficient integration with incident response allows attackers to further attack a system maintain persistence or you know basically tamper and extract or destroy data most breaches studies show the time to detect a breach is over 200 days which is a very long time typically detected by external file parties and those internal processes or monitors what we're talking about here guys is logging right so you've got logging and monitoring on your your security appliance whether that's a cisco and uh, or a a Citrix or whatever you choose to use uh, as your gateway into your platform or VPN provider. These things are really important that you must do. Monitoring to see who's logging in where, when and how and um, logging against that so that you have sufficient evidence and logs to go back and find out what's going on with your system because the last thing you want is someone to start hacking you for months and months on end and you not know about it and before you know it loads of information data breaches all that sort of bad stuff happens so um, really important get the logging and monitoring in place um, as soon as possible uh, with whichever security appliance you wish to use. I do go through some stuff in another video with um, Citrix ADM and I will discuss logging and monitoring um, in another video. So 
That's the top 10 security attacks from WASP. I'm now going to go through the configuration and installation of Webgo. Um, I will show, show you the demo and we'll move from there. If you enjoy this channel, guys, please subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. So what we're going to do today is two things. We're going to go through the Java installation and the WebGo installation and then start up the WebGo. Now, um, my previous experience was actually, I had a bit of trouble getting this to work, um, mainly because, uh, you know, they had a different version of Java and that wasn't supported. Um, so let me go over to Java and we will start there first. Um, so I've got over here to Java and we're going to be running... Um, it's Java 11 uh, 0.8, which is the LTS. So the thing is, Java has changed how they did things before. There are probably some other documentation on the websites um, suggesting running Java runtime version. Uh, but Java runtime version kind of ended at 8, um, at the end of 8. And since they've been releasing um, Java SE and Java development kits, um, so you just need to get the Java SE uh, and and download that. Um, so I've already got this downloaded, and also I have uh, WebGo 8, which is what we're going to be working with. So I just, if you head over to um, OWASP, if you head over to OWASP.org, which is the Open Web Application Security Project, you can then download this from the downloads over here so you go to standalone jars and this will come to github uh, there is an 8.1 available but i'm actually going to be using 8.0.0.26 so we can we'll download this and we'll download java um, and then we will continue with the installation so i've downloaded webgoat and the java application so we're going to go through the installation also created a folder called webgoat on the c drive so what we'll do first of all is do the installation of java so we'll do that now that's quite straightforward and quickly run through this we're going to install that so it's going to install in program files java we may need to know this later because uh, we may have to add the path that runs through the installation okay so it's been installed we're just going to do close there. Uh, now what I would do is go to Java itself uh, and the program files so here will be Java and then that's the kit and then underneath the bin and in here should be the Java executable where it is so what I want to do is just take this path uh, copy it and I'm going to go to system so let me just go to system yep uh, so once we're in here, we're just going to advanced settings um, and then we will go to environmental variables and then we have our little path here. So we're going to edit the path um, and what we want to do is add in the additional path, which will be this one. You can put program files in percentage as well, but I don't really care at the moment. So that's fine. Just add that in there. Um, so we've got our path in there, so now that should be um, included. Actually, here we go. System root. System root. Uh, we add it in here too. I think it's already in there, but let's just do it anyway. So we've got our paths in. Um, so at, just so that when you open up the command prompt uh, and you type in Java, it actually goes somewhere. So just going to test that out really quickly. If we go to CD WebGoat, and then what we'll do is we'll just, just type in Java, and you can see that Java works. So this is great. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll download the um, WebGoat from GitHub. So if you click on to the version M26, um, you'll have some options here for source code, but what we're looking for is the jar file. So we'll download that, uh, and then once we have that, we'll be able to start install it. So I now have the WebGoat server um, in my C WebGoat directory. Uh, I also have already in, 
we've already installed the Java. So next is to actually go through and kick off the, the web code. Okay, so we've got the string there that we need. Uh, what we're going to do now is execute that string and hopefully that will start up our web code. So press enter to continue. And that should start up the web code service now. Uh, let's just do allow access because we need to do this. Okay. Okay, so it says at the bottom here that we've got uh, started web goat service and it's running, which is great. Okay, so what we need to do now is just head over to our browser uh, and uh, now we need to actually yeah, put the port in. Uh, this is the address that we will go to for web goat and if we click that, it should then load up. Um, we can try web goat, web goat is the username and password to get in. No, thank you. And then we're in now. Um, so now we've completed the installation of WebGoat. Um, you will be able to use this to test against uh, insecurities, uh, whether you're using web security appliance or other. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching this video, please consider subscribing as I will be doing more videos. Uh, please give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. That's much appreciated. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank <laughs> you.